I was the middle child in a dysfunctional family growing up. My past is one littered with misfortune and poor circumstances, but I never did regret my upbringing, at least in any way that I could change. I have several events that have changed me to be the person that I am today, but none of those stand out as much as that time that we stayed at that haunted farmhouse. My father was abusive, mainly to my mother, but that didn't excuse him for what he was. He was your typical blue-collar worker, but he loved work and booze more than his own family. I remember the particular evening where my parents got in that fight, and my mother taking me and my two siblings away in the middle of the night. It was a warm summer evening, and we were all tired. Despite my mother's appearance of ruined makeup and small cuts on her face, she somehow convinced us that everything was going to be okay, and that the event itself didn't seem that unusual. It was a school night, so we had been tucked in for a few hours before all of us were in the back of my mom's car, trying to go back to sleep. We lived in a neighborhood in a medium-sized town, but mom took us that night several hours on the poorly illuminated highway, with the occasional yellow lights passing every couple of seconds. I don't remember falling asleep, but I do remember waking up in the driveway of that old wooden farmhouse. A single light glowed on the front porch, giving us enough vision to unload our lightly packed car, and we entered inside. I don't know how mom knew about this place or how she found it, but... We then stayed the night on the living room floor of this random house. Perhaps it was a friend's estate or a place mom knew about growing up. Other than that, the rest of the night went on without anything unusual happening. The next morning, my siblings and I got to sleep in and woke up to mom getting us breakfast at the nearby McDonald's. We were in a new town and from the looks of it, probably a new state. We were scared. Why were we with mommy somewhere far away? But on the same note, we were glad to not be in school. Kind of shows you how messed up we were as kids in regards to our priorities. The next couple of days were kind of bizarre. We had moved into the farmhouse that appeared to be vacant, but not quite abandoned. At that time, we didn't know this, but our mother had squatted us at that farmhouse, seeing how she didn't have anywhere else to go. But to us, this was a new adventure. We were slowly moving in more permanently over time. And during this, we began to notice things. The farmhouse itself sat on top of a hill, and a small field tucked away in the corner of Henderson County, Iowa. No one ever came out there, despite the house still having random bits of furniture and whatnot. We didn't have electricity for a while, but the farmhouse had a well and working water, which was enough for us at the time. I don't remember the exact timeline, but we did eventually get electricity. Mom started a new job in town, and my siblings and I had to go back to school. Things began to get weird once the initial shock of not seeing my dad wore off. The house itself was old, but not run down. It was two stories, no basement and an old attic that we weren't allowed inside. The children's room were on the second floor, while my mom's bedroom was on the first. My mom was gone a lot due to work, which made sitting home alone at the house with just my siblings a common occurrence. I remember the first thing that had happened was when my siblings and I walked home from school. We walked up the dirt path that led to the house to find the front door left wide open. The front door was old and rickety. You had to shut it a certain way or it wouldn't lock. At first, I thought the worst. Our dad had found us and was waiting inside to take us back home. But after a quick inspection of the house, no one was there. Mom worked two jobs at the time. She was a personal assistant to some management company in town, but she worked full-time and then she worked part-time at a diner down the road. The two jobs sucked, but she got to bring home food from the diner as kind of a perk, so we were always having pancakes at the house. One night as I was laying in bed, my little sister came into my room. She was tired, but clearly spooked by something in her room. Being the middle child, I was the perfect in-between sibling since my older brother was a bit of a grump when he was tired. What is it, Bella? I inquired, not lifting my head off the pillow. There's a man in my room, she said softly, in a way that both startled me and confused me. She wouldn't be this calm if there was actually a man there, so I wasn't initially worried. I don't think there's a man in your room, sweetie, but you can stay in here with me if you want. Bella stood, still holding her doll, leaning against my doorway. I want to sleep in my own bed, but he keeps staring at me. Make him go away. 
I rose slowly from my bed and walked over to her. She was sweating even though the house was quite cool. We walked over to her room and I went inside to see everything looking normal. Her pink nightlight casting grisly shadows across the strange room, which I used as an excuse saying that that's probably what she saw. She accepted the rationale and went back to bed. That was technically the first sighting anyone had had in that house. But things would not stop there. Phantom footsteps could be heard at odd hours. Normally, my mom's schedule made it difficult to know when she would be in and out, but it became evident that, even when she was clearly not home, that something was making sounds on the main level. My older brother Tyler started acting different. He wasn't getting much sleep and tried to spend as much time outside of the house as possible. For myself, I was rather oblivious. It wasn't until one night I had a terrible cough that required me to go to the main level to get a glass of water. That's when I first saw the dark lady. At first I was confused. She didn't appear how most ghosts appear, just standing in some room, but rather, she was floating up and in the corner of the kitchen. She looked at me as if she was confused that I could see her. Her appearance was cloudy, and her shape was slowly changing like some ball of energy. When I first saw her in the corner of my eye, I didn't know what to do. I was more confused than anything, but once the realization kicked in of what I was actually looking at, I naturally screamed. The apparition instantly disappeared. I woke the whole house and my mom and brother were in the kitchen with a matter of seconds. I told them what I had saw and the look of gloom hung on my mother's face. Tyler didn't look surprised and asked me a bunch of questions, some of which it seemed that he already knew. My first sighting of that woman was the floodgate for activity. Ever since that night, sightings of the cloud woman would vary, depending on which part of the house it was. Loud bangings could be heard upstairs when the house was empty, or the front door would slam several times throughout the night. After a couple of months of this, my mom began searching for other options for housing, but nothing was available within her budget. Things progressively got worse as the slams and banging slowly turned into screams at random hours of the night. One night it was so bad that my mom had to grab all of us and drive around for a few hours. We had nowhere to go except for the church parking lot, where we stayed there for a few hours before heading back to the house. I told my teachers about my situation, and they were genuinely concerned for our safety. We were all tired and dreading going home to whatever waited for us in that house. My mother wasn't religious, but even then she started making us going to church and praying, which surprisingly enough made a difference. We stayed in that house for two more years before being able to move to a small apartment. The apartment was thankfully on the other side of town, which made things much easier for all of us. Obviously the apartment was incredibly small and my siblings and I all had to share a room, but it was better than that place. I ended up graduating high school and going to the military for a couple of years. My mother ended up moving to another town and leaving Henderson County for good. Once out of the military, I started driving as a truck driver and would occasionally find myself driving through Henderson, but never had I had the desire to return to that hell house that stood on that lonesome hill. However, I do find myself wondering about it whenever I'm in town or on a dark and stormy night. I may have lived in a haunted house. So before I start, I want to make it clear that I don't believe in ghosts. I believe there is always a logical explanation for everything, and even in the following story, I believe there is a probably a logical explanation. I was never able to find one though, so believe what you will. In December of 2018, my partner, our 18-month-old son and I moved to a very old terrace house. We moved because we were in a two-bedroom flat and a rough area, and my manager's mother had recently moved to a care home, and she was keen to rent a house to someone she knew. A bit of background of the house itself. It is part of a terrace of five houses. The start of the terrace is a pub. Then there were three houses. Our house, another house, then a driveway that led to an area of private woodland accessible only to the residents of the house. As you can imagine, with an 18-month-old boy, having a garden in a small area of private woodland was an amazing selling point. 
The house is very old. It appears that at some point the row of houses may have been one building and was split into separate dwellings later. We were able to find a photo taken of the pub showing the row of houses from 1908. My manager believed at some point the building was used as a school, but I couldn't find anything to confirm that. The front door to the house opens directly onto the pavement outside, leading into the living room. Directly opposite the front door on the far wall of the lounge was an archway leading to the kitchen. On walking into the kitchen, the stairs leading upstairs are on the wall to the left. The stairs went upwards towards the front of the house. Just opposite the start of the staircase was the door to the conservatory, and the door to the garden was directly on the left when entering the conservatory. The window in the kitchen looked directly into the conservatory. The conservatory door opened to the small set of stairs leading to the garden. Walking up the stairs in the kitchen to the first floor led to a wall. Turning left at the top of the stairs looks directly at our bedroom door. Another door is on the same wall to the left of us which led to our son's room. And at the end of the short corridor was the door to the bathroom. I go into this level of detail as the layout is somewhat important to understand the weird stuff that happened. Onto the spooky stuff. As I said, we moved in December. We only had one day to do everything, so I started moving our stuff across from midnight, loading up the car, driving to the house, emptying everything into the lounge, and going back to the flat to get more. I think I managed 10 runs or so by the time my father-in-law arrived the next morning with the van to move the larger stuff. From the moment I opened the front door that night, I felt slightly unsettled. Due to the layout of the house, there was a clean view through the lounge, through the kitchen straight to the conservatory and garden. I didn't like something about the conservatory. I can't put my finger on what it was, but I just found that place creepy. It is worth noting that once we did move in, that feeling went pretty quickly, so it was likely the natural spookiness of just an old empty house in the early hours. For the first couple of months, nothing particularly interesting happened. The occasional strange sound that could be easily explained by the age of the house and pipes, etc. The first spooky incident occurred during the middle of the night. Our son was teething and needed more copal during the night. We kept the copal in the kitchen so I went down, filled the syringe with copal, gripped it between my teeth so my hands were free to open the baby gate, then started to head upstairs. Around three steps up, a shadow rushed past the stairs as if moving from the lounge door to the conservatory door. This was accompanied by a whooshing sound and the physical sensation of hair shifting from something moving quickly. What was particularly spooky was that our microwave was on the work surface, meaning the light from the clock was visible from the stairs. As the shadow flew past, it clearly blocked my view from the light from the clock for a split second. Naturally, I ran up the stairs as fast as I could, gave my son his capel and spent an hour trying to convince myself the shadow was caused by my syringe in my mouth getting between the light of the microwave and my eye. I tried to replicate this the following night for a while, but no way could I position myself or the syringe that would cause anything like this to happen. Nothing else happened for at least six months. Then one night, myself and my partner woke up to a crash from our son's room and him screaming. We jumped up and got to his room with no more than 10 seconds after the crash. We found our son in the middle of his bedroom, around 8 foot from his bed laying on the floor, crying in his sleep. He had a bed rail on his bed, and had never once fallen out of his bed, and even if he had, how far he had gotten from his bed and the volume of the crash made no sense. We got him back to bed, and both pretended we believed that somehow he had fallen out of bed. Another few months went by, and when taking my son to bed, the next creepy incident occurred. We had a very consistent routine. We'd go up the stairs and brush our teeth. My son would run to his bedroom, followed by me. Occasionally, he'd close the door and pretend to hold it shut as a game, so when his bedroom door was closed, I assumed that was what was happening. I gently pushed against the door to pretend I couldn't get in, and the door slammed really hard. If my fingers had been in the door, they'd come off. There was no way that my son could have pushed that door that hard. I told my son to let go of the door, and I pushed it with all of my might, 
but couldn't even get it opened. It wasn't stuck shut. The door would open slightly and get pushed back against me, as if someone was on the other side pushing against it. I shouted for my son to let go of the door, and he shouted back, his voice clearly coming from his bed, around 10 feet from the door. Then all resistance had stopped, and I flew through the door to find my son in his bed, as he had said. There's no way he could have gotten from the door to him under the covers in his bed in the split second it took me to fall through the door. Everything up until that point, I could explain in unlikely but possible scenarios. The syringe casting the shadow, my son falling from the bed, but that one, I could not explain. I still can't to this day. My son was too young to really understand when I asked him what was holding the door shut, so I never got any answers if he saw anything. He didn't seem scared though. I think he thought I was pretending I couldn't get it to make him laugh. After that, we didn't have many problems until the last day I spent at the house. We bought a house and moved everything across. I had to go back to the house one last time to pick up a few beds and have a clean. I waited until my son was in bed, so I got to the old house around 8 p.m. in the winter, so it was dark. I spent an hour in the house, and the best way I can describe it, it was like a haunted house from a movie. I could hear footsteps running around upstairs while I was downstairs, not like occasional footsteps. It sounded like my son and his friend did when they were running around upstairs. The only time it stopped was when I was starting to walk up the stairs. I hovered upstairs, and while doing so, the conservatory door downstairs slammed itself shut. When I hovered downstairs, all three doors upstairs slammed shut, one after another. All so hard, the house shook. When cleaning under the stairs, I could clearly hear someone walking down them. The stairs had gaps between them. It was sort of like a floating staircase. So, I'd have seen someone's feet if they were there, and I didn't see anything. But I clearly heard the footsteps pass over my head to the bottom of the staircase. Then, I started hearing talking upstairs. I couldn't make out words, but it sounded like a man arguing. That was my limit. I decided that anything I'd left behind at that point wasn't worth keeping. I grabbed the Hoover, ran over to the car, and never went back. My manager sold the house after we moved. I had no idea if the lady that had bought it had any problems, but I definitely won't go back. Dad's Last Visit When my dad passed, I wasn't able to get to him because I had just given birth to my son and I didn't have the means to travel. Although he and I had somewhat of a strained relationship, it hurt that I couldn't be there with him. I had to push aside my hurt and focus on my son the last few years, but every now and then, it hits me pretty hard, because I never got to say my final goodbye. Until a few weeks ago. I had a dream that I was walking through a beautiful forest, just at dusk, and I was thinking to myself how I'd love to stay here forever. I heard my dad's laugh beside me. When I looked over, he said jokingly, You can't stay here. You got stuff to do. He met my son. We talked for a few minutes about things that were troubling me and his death came up. I asked him if he missed me. No, he said, simply. My heart broke and he said, Come to my home and have a cup of coffee with me and I'll explain. Suddenly, we were at a little mound house like a hobbit house from Lord of the Rings, built into the side of a hill. It was so beautiful. When we walked through the door, it was like walking from outside to another outside. There was a very beautiful, comfy-looking chair that sat on top of a massive hill. Beyond the hill, in a beautiful valley, was a series of rooms all connected at odd angles, but with no roof. I looked closer and saw my siblings and their families in different rooms. It's like he had the best view of all of our lives, all in one place. He motioned me to sit. I was completely enveloped with a sense of peace, contentment, and happiness. My dad is standing next to me, and he says, I don't miss any of you, because I see you every day, every night, at every special moment. I hear you when you talk to me. I feel your love when you tell your kids about me. So, no, Mandy girl. I don't ever have a chance to miss you. I'm always here, watching over you, shouting down that I love you. That's when I woke up crying. 
I sat up the rest of the night just talking to my dad, telling him everything I never had a chance to, or took the chance, to say before he died. It was the best feeling. I don't know if anyone else needs to hear this, but our loved ones are always there, shouting down that they love us, even if we can't see them. The Bloody Walls Here's another story. My mother told me about something that happened when I was around five years old. We lived in an apartment. I don't remember much about it beside it being a typical one-room apartment. I slept in the bedroom with my mother, typical room with a bed, dresser, etc. She told me that I had nightmares there a lot, and I remember that vaguely. One day, she got a call from the school. I told them that my mother was dead and that the bedroom was smeared with blood. It was everywhere, and I was scared. It turned out that the last tenant was murdered in that room, and the scene that I was describing is actually what had happened. Middle of the Woods Experience Back when I was a little younger, about 15, me and my friends would decide to spend the night at one of my buddy's houses. We'll call him Jay. Jay lived about a 30-minute drive from the rest of us, up the highway down into the forest. We all went up and were having a good time playing Xbox, watching YouTube, just screwing around. After a few hours had passed, I had some weed and brought up that I was going on a walk through the woods and smoke a bit. Everyone seemed okay with the idea, so off we went, out his window and into the forest. After about 10 to 15 minutes of walking, we found a spot that we liked not too far from the access road, but still out of view of anyone. Let me set the scene here. No houses around us for a good bit. Nothing but trees. It was beautiful. A little cold for being in August, but still a great night. We started loading a bowl and got a few rotations around when we all heard a metal clank. We all jerked our heads around and looked, but there was nothing anywhere. It keeps going on at a consistent pace. Imagine the sound of a metal flagpole blowing in the wind, and a piece of metal on top of it is just slamming the flagpole. We all get a little bit creeped out and head back for the house when it starts getting louder and faster, more and more aggressive with each bang. We hightail it all the way back to his house and right back into his window. As soon as we were all in, it stopped. All a little shaken up, we decided to give it an hour before we try again. After a while, we decide it's been long enough and we step out his window. Two of us get all the way out and it starts up again, just as loud and as fast as it was before. We said screw smoking for the rest of the night, and we called it a night. When I was about eight or nine years old, I thought that for a child my age, I had been rather fearless. That is a silly notion, even if you view it though through the lens of everything being relative. Why does this matter? Because one of the most vivid moments of my life came about during the night, in the middle of a school week. My dad worked nights as a truck driver and had done so for many years by that time, so he usually had very interesting stories to tell me. He once told me about how scary it was to drive his truck through Gary, Indiana in the middle of night, and he was not one to scare easily, which is relevant to this story. Being the boy who liked to hang around his dad, I slept in the same bed as he did that night and we talked for what seemed like hours. I had trouble sleeping as a boy, so this usually helped me to go to sleep. My bedroom had a closet, and in that closet was the entrance to the attic. I used to have fears of things popping out of the closet and frightening me, although it never happened. I finally grew out of this phase, and this thought popped into my mind on that night, and I distinctly remember telling my dad, word for word, Dad, I'm so glad that ghosts aren't real. He didn't hesitate. Oh, yes they are, boy, and you'd be smart not to fool around with that stuff. He told me in the most serious voice I'd ever heard from him up to that point in my life. My life changed that day because I'd never had any reason to doubt my dad. He wasn't one to make this sort of stuff up. He had me curious, and at first I did try to cast my doubt, but he persisted and told me a story. In 1978, a year before he and my mom were married, Mom rented an apartment in the city of Fort Wayne, Indiana. I even know the street name, and I know the house. 
The apartment was on the second story, and the landlady was quite aged by that time, well into her 80s. When we moved in, the old lady told my mom that her sister passed away in that house, and that was why there were all these crucifixes everywhere, no matter where you turned. Laundry was done in the basement, and she refused to let anyone go down into the basement alone. According to my mom and my dad, the basement was particularly creepy, where one kept hearing noises, never mind the noises of the gas furnace or the air traveling through the pipes. Over the period of several months, things would happen that were not easily explainable. My folks would come home from work to find the refrigerator door open, food on the counter, faucets running, stoves would be turned on. What complicated matters was when friends would visit and stay the night. One in particular was stoned all the time, claimed that he woke up to the refrigerator door open and food being tossed into the air. Of course, any reasonable person would brush this off as ramblings of a stoner, but this man swore by it, and he never returned. It is important to note that my mom had several prior paranormal experiences as a child, which I shall tell, and was still skeptical at this time. My father was raised Catholic, and he, of course, did not believe in the paranormal until it happened to him. I get chills just typing that sentence. One night, my mom was in the bathroom getting ready for bed, while dad was laying on the bed trying to sleep. All seemed quiet enough, nothing out of the ordinary was happening. And then, from out of the blue, dad heard a series of knocks on the bifold closet doors next to the bed. It sounded as though as it came from within the closet, like someone was knocking from inside of it, against the door. This caused my dad to abruptly open his eyes just in time to observe the bifold door slide open, and out came the headless apparition of a woman who looked like she had turned to see my dad lying on the bed, and then vanished. Panic-stricken, my dad called for my mom, and very sternly said, We're moving. Recently, when I was researching these stories, I used the names that my parents told me to find out who it was that perished for each story, and got it all. For the particular story, I learned that the landlady's older sister had passed away from brain cancer. Perhaps that's why her apparition was headless. It seemed every ghost that I'd ever heard of was headless had been the result of brain cancer, a gunshot to the face, or even a beheading. Coincidence? Anyways, that was the story that introduced me to the paranormal, but certainly not the scariest. When Dad told me this story, I nearly had to change my night clothes. I was so terrified. But still, I thought this was fantasy, but a really good story nonetheless. I know this because the next day when I was getting ready for school and Mom was getting ready for work, I told my mom the story that Dad told me, and to my surprise, she confessed that it was true. And then she proceeded to tell me two individual stories from when she was younger. I'll tell you the best one second. In the late 1960s, after my mother and her father immigrated here from former West Germany, they moved many times between Mississippi, Louisiana, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, and then finally, the family relocated to where they are now, in northern Indiana. They moved several times even in this state, over a short period of time. There's a quiet small town called Uniondale, where the first haunted house was situated, my mother is the oldest of four children, and the youngest at the time was still on a stroller. Relevant information for this one. And when the family moved into a house in rural Uniondale, they were told that the little boy had died recently, and his spirit was alleged to be haunting the house. For many years, Mom told the story as if the young boy was playing with his father's gun and shot himself. There were bullet holes in the wall, but from my research, I was able to discover that an 11-year-old boy lived there was killed in an auto accident. Anyways, the child slept upstairs, and there was a room that they were not allowed to enter. No one went in. The floorboards were so dusty that they could see footprints of a little child who had walked over them. That's the lighter side of the story. The darker side came when the boy's spirit would forcefully shove the children down the stairs including my aunt who was still in a stroller. Eventually, the children had to sleep downstairs while the adults slept upstairs in the haunted part of the house. 
Thankfully, the family had not lived there for very long, and I'm sad to say that through my research, the boy's father recently passed away in 2019. And now, I say the spookiest story for last. I'll begin this story with the actual background to it first this time. From the 1940s to the mid-1960s, there was a large family in my county who were known for their antics and alcoholism. Raymond was the vet of the Second World War, and he married in the mid-1950s. Together with his wife, they had a daughter. Some years later in the 1960s, Raymond and his wife split up, but hadn't actually divorced. No official account on why they split up was given, but the story in the newspaper mentioned the split, and also mentioned that Raymond was saddened and deprived of his daughter, and he didn't get to see her much at all, perhaps heartbroken. Heartbroken never mixes well with alcoholism, of course. Raymond was an alcoholic, as were his brothers. One day in April of 1968, he was with his brothers at the house, and the two were intoxicated, according to the police blotter that I retrieved from the newspaper archives. Their alcoholism was finally mixed one with a dangerous element, and that was a loaded gun. According to the blotter, Raymond and his drunken stupor pointed it up at the ceiling inside of the house and shot off the gun multiple times to his brother's enjoyment. Again, they were intoxicated. It was a seven-shot, 22 caliber revolver by the police account. And anyone in the firearms hobby would know that a 22 rimfire is not always a reliable round, and sometimes does not go off when the trigger is pulled. You may see where this is going. When the revolver did not go off, Raymond carelessly tried to look down the muzzle of the revolver, not knowing that it was a hang fire. Suddenly, the cartridge detonated, and Raymond was shot in the face. He later died in the hospital that evening. In 1970, my mother's family rented the house after the early one proved to be too terrifying to live in. As the story goes, the floorboards in the house had very faint bloodstains that began upstairs and ran all the way down out the back door. One could paint over them, and the stains would later reappear. On Christmas Eve of that year, the family was gathering in the living room downstairs, watching the television. The program, I am told, was Art Linkletter, and he was shoving off popular toys for that Christmas. Suddenly, the family heard a gunshot, and a loud and ghastly moan from upstairs. It was enough to curdle one's blood. Did that get your hair to raise? I'm not finished yet. What the hell was that? My grandfather yelled. Then, the entire family witnessed something that, to this day, my aunts and my mother swear by, down to the very last detail. A headless man in flannel stumbled down the stairs into the living room, nearly falling over. Then he rushed through the living room and out through the back door, where he tripped over the threshold, fell forward, and vanished. Years later, when my mom started dating my dad, she learned that he used to date an old babysitter of theirs. Said babysitter's family actually moved into that house after my mom's family had left. The babysitter told dad that the house had to be exercised, and they never had that problem again. Incidentally, the house is still infamous for this haunting in my area. Nearly everyone knows about it, and many still remember what Raymond was like when he was still alive. After all, it really wasn't that long ago. I live in Arkansas, lived here for the majority of not all my life. I have experiences in all forms, UFO sightings, ghosts, demons, including the hat man, and the occasional sleep paralysis or a dream in another dream that I couldn't wake from. Those are other stories though. I want to tell you about the current duplex I've been living in for almost a year now. My lease ends this month, thank God. The events aren't in any particular order because I didn't keep up with the dates or times. It happened all the time I first moved in, till I do move out. They say when a place looks appealing and draws you in close, it's because of an entity. Although I'm not bothered by them, I simply ignore them. I still decide I want to live at this duplex. It's a nice three-bedroom, two-bath. After signing all the paperwork, I came by first week in July. I always clean my places with doors open. I'm just superstitious. Well, I was completely alone when I started hearing loud banging on my hallway walls. Kids soon to be bedroom and closets, 
this happens in complete daylight. Again, I just ignore it because I had a feeling. Another time, I'd say a good month later, after moving everything into my new place and my kids were home, including their dad. We were divorced, but he was helping me move. He was on the couch sleeping while I was organizing stuff in my bedroom, when my doorbell rang, which I thought was odd because I knew I wasn't expecting any company. My son and I heard it and we both were confused, so I went to open the door, and nobody was outside. I instantly closed it because I do believe an entity can't enter your home if you open the door. During the time living here, I've heard up to three entities, a woman and two men. I think it's a demon since it can only be one. They are in my attic mostly, or on the other side. I hear footsteps all over all day and night. There was a time my neighbor was gone for two to three months. I would hear music, entities opening and closing doors, talking, laughing, even turning on the showers and turning the neighbor's porch lights on and off, which I took pictures of and might find them. I've recorded before it's too hard to hear, but with earbuds it's clear as day. You can hear the entity. I was so scared one time I asked my best friend, I'll call her Mia, to come stay the night with me. That night it seemed like it was going to be peaceful. Oh, how we were wrong. We both heard doors closing, banging and like the neighbor was throwing a party. Maya said that when we all went to bed, she heard banging on the windows in the guest room, aka the toy room across the living room, and mine. I was dead asleep. I didn't hear anything that night other than the earlier noises before bedtime. Afterwards, fast forwarding, I'd come home from work and instantly hear footsteps or banging in the attic, while in my room and closet, or I'd hear it in my kids' room. I didn't mention it, but the duplex is all brick, so I shouldn't have heard anything in the kids' closets or mine. The banging is all around. I sometimes stay here alone, too, since I co-parent. One night, I heard someone banging extremely hard on the back door. My room has access to the porch outside. The door is glass, so you can imagine how loud it was. I stayed frozen before checking with nobody outside. I also heard footsteps on my porch with nobody outside when I would check. I've told my kid's father, who didn't believe until he heard the banging one night around 9 or 10 p.m. when we were in my bedroom. Fast forward a bit again around February. My brother said I should sage the place. I didn't think it would work, which it didn't, because during the time I started saging with prayers in Spanish, the entity just followed me. I felt a presence just mocking me. He doesn't want to leave this place. I've saged my place four times and the banging continues. My neighbor finally did come back at one point and the entity is still here. I hear it dragging something heavy as if someone might have been murdered and put away in a box to be discarded. When I hear my neighbor snoring, the walls are pretty thin, so it's not my fault. I would hear the entity dragging something heavy again, or even the loud footsteps and banging in the attic area, so I know it's definitely not the neighbor in the attic or doing all the other stuff. The entity follows me around when I'm alone. It'll follow me all the way to the kitchen, the front area to my bedroom, back area of my place. One night I was alone, and I experienced almost sleep paralysis. I felt the energy of two entities. One was a female. I heard her speak to me, but since I just kept fighting them, I couldn't really make out what she was trying to tell me, but I would feel the heaviness of sleep paralysis trying to overcome me, so I fought much harder that urge into falling captive into their presence, till I broke free, and everything disappeared, and I could breathe again. During spring break, my kid's father took them on a trip to Florida for a week. I'm not sure why I had woken up from a deep sleep till I looked at the time, 3.40 a.m. I instantly knew what had woken me. While I laid awake trying to go back to sleep, I heard my laundry door close. The laundry room is in the middle of my place, so in my hallway. I got goosebumps. I told my little sister about it, and she said it could have been the wind. But I totally disagree. Back in September, I think, during my niece's birthday weekends, I had my older sister, I'll call her Cynthia, come over and stay the night. She heard nothing, which is fine, so at first she didn't believe me. Fast forward to this month, I keep telling Cynthia about my place, and I would ask her if she was sure that she didn't sense anything. We are all pretty sensitive to the paranormal, and my sister has the ability to see spirits. She says, no, of course. 
So yesterday, June 2nd, Cynthia came over to hang out all day, and I decided to tell her more about what had been happening here, and I refused to speak about it in English, or inside, so we both stepped out onto my porch. While outside, I was smoking, just talking away till she got goosebumps all over her body. She said she could feel the entity's extremely cold presence, and that she now believes me. The entity won't leave her alone, and kept touching her arms and legs. She'd get goosebumps where he'd touch her. The entity followed us inside, so he continued to touch her. She confirmed it was a man who seems evil, and like I said before, she said he's mocking me and will not leave. It's best to move out ASAP because I think he's a demon. Night in Las Vegas This took place on October 1st in 2021. We go to Las Vegas frequently because we live only a few hours away in California, and we head there for a typical excursion. I enjoy trying new food or staying at a different hotel each time. Over the years, we have stayed at nearly every hotel on the Strip. Some of these hotels are decades old, dating back to 1940s, 50s, and 60s. So, understandably, we've witnessed the occasional strange noise, smell, or bump in the night. But the strangest thing that we've ever happened to come across was the newest hotel edition, Resorts World. Resorts World opened in June of 2021, and I was excited to stay there because it was something genuinely new for both of us. It was also our first time traveling post-pandemic, so we splurged a little and stayed at the Conrad side of the hotel, which was marketed as affordable luxury hotel. It was a beautiful room, with all new technology embedded into the room to make things convenient and fun. I couldn't have been more pleased with the room. We unpacked, explored the resort downstairs a bit, did some gambling, ate dinner, and then I headed up to the room to get ready for bed. While I did that, my boyfriend stayed downstairs at the resort to do some more gambling and drinking. He usually stays up a lot later than me, so this was pretty normal. While I was laying in bed on my phone, I started to hear noises. Most of the noises were common hotel noises, like pipes in the walls, bumps from the floor above, plumbing when another room starts their shower, standard stuff. But some of the noises were not normal. Mainly, I could hear creaking from the bathroom, as if someone was in there standing or walking. Almost like they were standing at the sink getting ready for bed, moving around like a normal person. I didn't really notice it, though, until the sound started to move towards me, leaving the bathroom and moving into my bedroom. It sounded like the footsteps were coming towards me, but they were slow and uneven. I looked up from my phone and didn't see anything. I reasoned with myself that it was nothing, but something was off. It just felt off. Like I said before, we come to Las Vegas frequently, and we've stayed at nearly every hotel but I've never felt creeped out like this. Even though my mind was being rational, it was just the floor, it's nothing. My heart rate was going up, and I had a bad feeling in the pit of my stomach. I couldn't control it. It was like something was in the room with me, giving me a terrible feeling. I stared into the darkness for a few minutes, and I could still hear the footsteps coming closer. I was staring right at it, but there was nothing there. They were moving so slowly, and they were approaching the foot of my bed. I could feel goosebumps. I couldn't even blink. The footsteps stopped at the foot of my bed, and then the room felt eerily quiet, completely silent. But whatever it was, it was still there. It was at the foot of my bed, just standing there. Was it watching me? What was its intention? My phone was frozen in my hand. I didn't even want to look away. I was so afraid, and I didn't even know why. I don't know how much time passed with me just staring in an empty, silent hotel, but eventually I texted my boyfriend. Hey, can you come up to bed now? I'm getting spooked in the room by myself. He responded, Okay. Texting him and knowing he was on his way gave me some comfort, and I tried to get my courage back and calm down. I could hear common hotel sounds again and that was comforting too. Perhaps that thing left while I distracted myself. When my boyfriend came up to the room, he teased me for getting spooked, and we had a laugh, and he got ready for bed. 
I felt better and mostly forgot about what had happened. I think we both agreed the noises were just because the hotel was new and hadn't been lived in very much. However, one thing we both feared in every Las Vegas hotel was a break-in. So my boyfriend put his giant hydro flask water bottle in front of the entry door. We do this at every hotel so that if someone tries to sneak in, which happens a lot in Las Vegas, they would knock over the super loud water bottle and startle us awake. Finally, we both went to sleep. I was fast asleep when something jolted me awake. It was my boyfriend thrashing out of bed, throwing the covers back, yelling. Hello? Who's there? He rushed to his feet and headed straight for the entry door. I was still half asleep and asked, Huh? I was squinting because the room was very bright now, but my boyfriend looked pretty distraught and didn't answer. He went to the bathroom, checked behind the door, checked the closet, checked the couch area. It was obvious something had spooked him. What happened? I asked. The lights turned on, he said. Did you turn them on? No. What do you mean? Maybe you bumped the switch in your sleep. No. All the lights came on. Something somehow had triggered all the lights in our hotel room to turn on in the middle of the night. The bathroom, the bedroom, the little hallway in front of the door, everything had come on. What could have possibly switched on all the lights at once? We sat in confusion for a few moments, then tried to think clearly. Did someone try to break into the room? No. The stuff in front of the door hadn't been moved, and the water bottle was still standing upright. Was there a master button you could press to turn on everything, and did it get touched on accident? No. There were two separate master buttons, one for the bedroom and one for the bathroom. Was it maybe a wiring issue? After all, it was a new hotel. Maybe that sort of thing happens. We decided to call the front desk. We weren't sure what to even say to the clerk on the phone, so we just told her all the lights had turned on and woke us up, and that we hadn't pressed any light switches. She sounded pretty confused herself, and asked if we wanted her to send someone up to take a look at it. At this point, it was 3 or 4 in the morning, so we said no. She said, okay, and took note of our call and wrote down the issue. We said goodbye and hung up and sat in silence for a while. Now we were both creeped out, but we did our best to go back to sleep. The next day, we talked about what had happened, but we still couldn't come to any definite conclusions. To this day, I am still puzzled by it. The front desk never contacted us to tell us how the issue was resolved. It may very well be that the new hotel was still working on its wiring, but what were those eerie footsteps coming towards me in the middle of the night? Was a phantom messing with us? I wish I remembered the room number so I can request not to stay in that particular room again. Just in case. My story. This one is sort of complicated, but I'll keep it as simple as I can, beginning with some background. I'm from Indiana, which is a quiet Midwest state in the US. Nobody really thinks much of it, as we are generally seen as a boring state with nothing much to do. Well, outside of the small town of Osayan, I had my thrills. My mother alleges that when I was a toddler, I would point at corners of the room and say, old man, which I don't remember. A few years later, my grandmother passed away, and I finally saw a photograph of my grandfather, who had passed away long before I was even thought of. I said to my mother that he was the old man, which I do still remember. As a side note, my other grandparents had a weird statue of a cowboy called Card Shark that I was so terrified of and would say that that was the old man. The resemblance was dubious, but nevertheless, it was part of the story when I was younger. Over the first 20 years of my life, I lived at home with my parents in one of the oldest houses in the county, built around 1865. We had a hallway on the main floor, which I always had the creeps walking by, and the stairway was unnerving to say the least. I would hear noises, and my parents would tell stories of things that they would hear and say. By the time I was 14, I was starting to doubt that the house had something off about it, and almost as if it was meant to prove me wrong. I had my first weird incident. In September of 2005, I recall hearing a recorded message on our telephone. The voice was blood-curdling, very gravelly, somewhat metallic, and sounded like a person with throat cancer 
said, five years tall. The number was unlisted and it came in at 9.45 p.m., which no one remembered hearing the phone ring for. I experienced a nightmare about it a few days later. That was the beginning of it all. I always sleep with a fan, especially now, because the white noise helps me sleep. Well, on April 6th, it was cold and I kept the fan off. Around midnight, I awakened to a frightening white apparition of what appeared to be a man glaring down at me beside my bed. In a second, I was able to deduce this before my covers went over my head. I had heard of sleep paralysis before, and my mind was panicking trying to reason with what I had just witnessed. Just as I assured that I was experiencing sleep paralysis and hallucinating, the experience grew worse. The entire second story of our old house had original hardwood floors, and I heard footsteps go from beside my bed to what I believed to be the other room. This was not sleep paralysis. This was something far more sinister. I was frozen, unable to bring myself from out under the covers to turn on my lamp. A few minutes passed by and the slow creepy footsteps returned to what I believed to be by the foot of my bed. Then I heard something I shall never forget. The apparition let out a quiet, not exactly mean-spirited growl, like an old man's sort of growl, if there was ever one. That was the end of the experience. I awakened to see the apparition again in September of that year, but since it was in front of a window where I could see car lights from, I shook it off as that. And it didn't happen again until November 21st of that year. Oh boy, was I in for a real surprise. I even remember the dream I was having. I was driving a red convertible Ford Thunderbird through a desert, and an unknown passenger in the front seat made the growl I heard back in April. My eyes shot open to my horror and I witnessed the white apparition walking briskly up the staircase which was beside my bed. I threw the afghan cover over my head and through a large hole I kept open. I watched as the apparition reached the landing, appearing to duck down four times as if to see if I was lying in my bed. Then he vanished through the door into the next room. But the story does not end here. Months later, I set up a tape recorder in the room next to mine, and upon playing it back, my family and I heard the voice of a young child, a girl, say, Where's my mother? It was distinct. In June of 2009, mediums came to visit us and almost right away, they wanted to see the creek next to our property, which was not actually on our property. They returned and told us what had happened. Many decades before this, a young girl drowned in the creek. Her family is hiding in the house but never shows themselves. A woman walks the floors upstairs, and she appears to have perished from advanced consumption, or something of that nature. The man who I had seen was a farmer who was angry that we were living in his house. No names were given, and the only evidence that they had was a photograph of the girl in the kitchen window, sporting red hair which was braided, and an unseemly bluish face. The mediums did mention that there was something lurking outside that they could only step onto the property every once in a while and it wasn't good. Also, the stairway appeared to be a vortex, where things come and go, possibly explaining the staircase sighting. For the most part, that was the end of my experiences, but the story didn't end there. In 2019, 10 years after the mediums came to see us, I had a dream one night with the girl that told me that my family would be moving soon from the house, and that they must. I actually took that dream seriously because the mediums told me that I was supernaturally sensitive and that these things may come to me even in a subnomular form. Mom and Dad didn't appear to think much of it because they were quite happy living there and had been there for over 30 years. And about a year or two after that, I had another dream, this one far more profound. I had dreamed that I was walking down a dirt road in what appeared to be in the distant past. I came upon our old house which looked like a shack in the middle of nowhere, and where an old man was chasing hens around the front porch. An old woman dressed in period clothing came to my right side, and said to me quite clearly, Yeah, old Jacob Myers is an old ornery man. That name stuck out to me. So at that time I was doing ancestry research online, as I had little else to do in my free time. Using the subscription that I had, I plugged in the name Jacob Meyer and to my shock, I discovered an obituary from one Jacob Meyer in my county. The obituary read that old Jacob Meyer was a pioneer in this county. 
He had lived here since the 1850s and lived one mile east of the nearest settlement. He had suffered a debilitating stroke and perished a few days later in 1896 in his home. My county has public access to various plant maps which I immediately pulled up on their website and discovered that the old house, one mile east of the town, was indeed once owned by Jacob Meyer. Perhaps the stroke explained his weird movements whenever I saw him. As for his wife Martha, evidently she must be one who passed away of advanced consumption and who I on Saturday morning awakened to, hearing gasping for air. For in 1906, she passed away in the house. I found her death certificate through my research, and her listed cause of death was la grippe, which in some cases can be seen as advanced consumption over a hundred years ago. I never did receive full disclosure on the girl and her family. However, the original voice message that said five years tall was correct in that my family suffered miserably in many ways for a period of five years. And worse still, my father ended up passing away of a stroke in 2022, and my mom had to move out of the house because it became too hard to not see him for. They had essentially rebuilt parts of the house. When the realtors posted pictures online of the house, I immediately looked at them and saw the little girl standing in the kitchen door looking out. To end the story, the house was about half a mile away from the oldest cemetery in the county, and I once went there to find the headstone for Jacob and Martha Meyer, which I did find in a dilapidated and crumbling state. Sometime later, my mom went with me, and she wanted to see it too. I remember exactly where it was, and when we came upon the stone, it had been replaced with a new one. That cemetery, by the way, was for many years being watched over by a tree that appeared to have extreme scary faces in its trunk. My friend once took several pictures of it, and the photos all came out solid gray. That's my story. For now.